So we're going to start because I have enough. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got eight boards and I count 11 voting members with a 12th board member down there visiting us. <laughs> I can't believe you can't find something better to do than come to this tonight, but thank you very much. I think I'd be able to. Yeah, I know. Not. He's yeah. going to tell me how to vote. So oh, okay. So you should sit closer to Dan no, no, because sometimes no. you need to. Yeah. 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 You thought we were going to see Avengers. I tricked him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we should have told everybody that. We're going to preview a movie. So, if, if, oh, I think, yeah, so I'm count 11 people. So why don't we do this if nobody has a problem? Why don't we run around just so that the, the camera guy can get our names. We'll start down at the Marlboro Contingency. Uh, David Holtzapfel, non-voting member and observer. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren Poster, proxy of voting member. Douglas Cord Marlboro. <laughs> Dan MacArthur Marlboro. Dave Sklar, Wardsboro. Senna Stevenson, Jamaica. Jennifer Jordan Duque, Jamaica. Thank you, Robert Windham. Rich Warner from Dover. Al Glossin Townsend. Ken McFadden, New Fame. Joe Winrich from Leland and Gray. Uh, Bill Anton, Superintendent. Lori Langevin, Business Office. Lori Garland, Business Manager. Stephanie mm -hmm. Hancock, Top Director of Special Education. Peter Barris, Sprague. Mm -hmm. yeah. Six, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so there's 11 of us. So we need four more. I know Emily's coming. Yeah. Laura was going to try to get here. Pardon? Emily's coming? Yeah, she should be here about quarter of. So if nobody has a problem, we're going to run through the agenda because there's nothing until the end that we need to actually make a vote on. Okay. So if you folks will allow me, we can be an executive committee. Oh, we only warned it as a board meeting. I was executive also. Mess that one up. So we've called to order. Review and revise the agenda as may be advisable. So I have a request from the superintendent that if we have enough people, um, to review contracts for board signature um, at the end of the meeting. Um, well, the Marlboro Board would like to, I, I understand that there's professional development to be discussed during this meeting, but we had issues arise at our school which made us look more broadly, and I'd like to try and talk to the board, uh, either in executive session, where I can use personnel examples. I don't feel comfortable doing that um, in an open meeting, but uh, but we can also discuss it um, in an open meeting, but I just won't use the examples. It'd be maybe a little bit less clear. But um, So our questions might be answered, and we might be able to figure things out based in that professional development section. But if not, I'd like to put on maybe 15 minutes for that. So just so there's transparency and, and everybody understands, Doug and I have talked a few times, and I did confer with Al and with um, Emily, the officers. So I suggested Doug was ready to pull this. I suggested he give us this as a placeholder. So if during the meeting, you guys, everything is all, we're all set, we have no other questions, then when we get to that, Doug can just say no, I, you know, we're all set. If there is something he wants to use for a better example, he didn't feel he, he was able to make his point, then they'll be able to request, uh, make a motion to move into executive session, give the reason, and we'll be able to vote on that and go into executive session if it's appropriate. Okay. So is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Is there any other executive, uh, an executive, I'm sorry, is there any other additions or deletions or uh, revisions to the agenda? <clears throat> Rich, we're, we're not going to be ready to have the uh, support staff. You told me that. I'm sorry, I forgot that. No, it's okay. So that will, this, the education support staff contract tentative agreement will come off. So we have these other contracts. We have those other two items, the WCSU contracts and possibly something from Marlboro. Everybody okay with that? We're staying pretty close on time. Um, we have the minutes of the March 21st, 2018 meeting. I believe Bill, Bill, uh, Bill pass those out, so we will sit on those, and if we do get a quorum, we'll vote on them as a as a board. Okay. Was there anything that anybody noticed though that they'd like to bring up or mention? Okay. While we're going to go to number four, then new business state of the WCSU a journey presentation discussion. Um, by Jen, Director of Curriculum and Instruction. 
while she's doing that presentation, I know she's going to be showing us some pictures. There's some handouts. I'm going to be passing around the check ledger that our BM, which means business manager, not that other thing, um, gave us. So if anybody wants to look at that, I'll send it down this way. When you guys get done, just make sure it gets back up this side. Okay, Jen, we're going to turn the meeting over to you. Oh, I'm actually going to move in front of you. Can we sit down that side, right? Could you, the people, whoever are in the back, just introduce yourselves for the TV guy? Sure. Hi, I'm Laura Hazard, principal at Shemekabili School. I'm Tammy Bates from Board of Hi, and I'm Jen McCusick, uh, Director of Curriculum Instruction. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Selena Romo. I'm late. <laughs> were you were you here for the were you here for the movie or were you here for the meeting? <laughs> Where's that means I'm not voting, just so you know. Okay. As long as you guys just have three votes, we don't care who it is. You're all there. <laughs> no. Good. Ready? Thank you. Sorry. No. No. I'm Pot Avengers might be coming up. I was kind of excited. Um, so, uh, good evening everybody. Bill asked me to put together um, some information for you for tonight and uh, thinking about our journey in the last 18 months to two years and moving forward. Um, so I put some things together. Um, we actually started preparing for this in like January, February and it's been a really neat process to go through because um, as we've learned more, we've added more and, and thought more about as we're moving forward. So Stephanie's going to be my special help on that. Does that mean? That mean yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tonight I've really divided the presentation into three parts and um, those parts are that we're going to look at what the research has shown us, what we know about, and then what we have learned about us and our plans for moving forward. So um, much of what I do is um, I, I really like research and I like learning about studies and the 30,000 foot view. Oh, I'm sorry, you do have packets in front of you. I hope everybody got one that you can take notes if you like. Um, and so anytime someone tells me something or gives me research, I'd like to go back and find out more. Like pretty much every time um, because that's how I learn and that's how I like to think. And I've, um, it might be grad school that kind of beat this into me, but it's, you don't say I, if you say I think, you say I think because of these things that back up why I got to this point. So we're starting with the research and the studies and then thinking about what we have learned about us through those multiple studies and our own work and then our plans and our um, projections Okay. All right, so what the research and studies show. Um, again, this is really um, lots of different pieces. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit today about, about the DMG report, the IFR, some of the other things that have come out for us as an SU, but this is really about what we know from these national studies about education and pedagogy, which is the teaching of students and young children. All right, so. This is national research. It's actually probably international at this point. Um, but we know that third grade is a critical benchmark. And what I mean for, by this is when we look at that from the 30,000 foot view, that instruction in third grade changes from learning to read, like a, to reading to learn. So you are moving into content and being able to access curriculum and think deeper and have um, building on your background knowledge. It's critical for our students when we look at that third grade benchmark, which is really the end of second, it's really important, and the studies have all shown this, that we need to have students on board by the end of second grade. They need to really be solid at the end of second grade and starting third grade for the future. Um, statistically, grade three is a pivotal year for catching up, meaning if students have deficits in their skills, um, it is essential that we figure out what those skill deficits are and teach them so that they catch up with their peers. Um, early intervention is critical. So this is from a 2015 National Center for Analysis of Longitudinal Data in Educational Research. I chose this because it is a meta-analysis of like 30,000 different studies. So this is not um, one study, one place. This is a lot of information going into this. And these are just highlights from it. Another piece of the study talks about special ed national data, special education national data. And I'm sharing this because it's gonna make sense as I talk about MTSS and the other things and universal design. But special ed national data, pre-K to grade three, 41% of students, identified students, exit services during those years. So in other words, if you have a student who has an IEP, during pre-K to three, 41% of those students will exit. They'll get off their IEPs. They'll be in general ed. 
once you hit grade three to age 19, which is when we're done with high school, that number drops to 26%. So meaning we need to catch them earlier because it's harder and harder to get them off of the IEPs as they get older. Doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it's harder. It's harder to catch them up. It's harder to provide intervention. It's harder to provide support. Okay? So I share this because a lot of times um, I want to kind of uh, bust up some jargon too. Uh, education is like MTSS, CIP, you know, uh, CNAs. We throw jargon out all the time. And one of the things you hear about is universal design or universal design for learning. UDL. Um, and universal design is really the concept that all students with disabilities are general education students first. Like, it's not a separate pot. Everybody comes together in general education. I'm getting good nods from special yes. ed directors. That makes me feel really good. Okay. <laughs> um, and that, um, so when we think about universal design, this is, um, it's about core instruction. And so the points I want to, I'll read through this. So the point I want to make about um, universal design, students with disabilities are general education students first. Core instruction is for all students. That's your first line of attack. The stronger your core instruction is, the, the stronger our students are, and the least likely to have those instructional pieces that are missing um, in the separate tiers. Um, formative assessments ensure inclusion. I'm going to slow down a second, sorry. When I think about the core instruction, what I want to share with you is that as a classroom teacher, the content knowledge is really essential and their pedagogical strategies and what, how they teach and the instructional strategies that they teach is so important when you think not just about special ed, but all students in that group. Universal design is also about formative assessments. Um, it says formative assessments ensure inclusion in grade level curricula through differentiation and support. This last part, I really want to say it and pause and think. 80 to 85 percent of students with disabilities can master grade level content if they receive educational support within the general education classroom. So universal design is 80 to 85 percent of students with disabilities get what they need if core instruction is strong. Um, when we think about assessment, we're thinking about not just the students, but our instruction. So formative assessment means I use that to think about what I'm going to do with my kids, but it also means I need to look at if I'm doing a good job. Like, am I, I shouldn't say it that way. Am I doing, teaching the right things in the right way to meet most of my kids' needs? Like, that's the purpose, it's both for the kids and for us. And when we think about this last piece, we, we need to make resources for the 15% of the kids who can't, can't get it all, can't master it in that time. But really that focus. I don't love public speaking. I'm just going to throw it out there. Go. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> All right, next slide stuff. Thanks. All right. Can everyone see what this is? Maybe. Dishwasher. Okay, excellent. So, this is my analogy. Um, I will give credit to Nell Duke from the University of Michigan. Um, analogy. So, you have a dishwasher. Dishes come out, run it. Um, three to four of your dishes are dirty. Probably take them out, it happens. You might take them out, give them a quick hand wash. They're good to go. It takes just a few minutes, you put them in the cupboard, and you're all good. Maybe one or two in there need like that extra scrub. You just need a little extra something to get it clean and put into so they're all clean and ready to go. The dishwasher is MTSS or tiered support. It's universal design. When we look at how we provide support, all the dishes is what we're trying to do. So if I open that dishwasher and every time I open it, Half of the dishes are dirty. What do you do? Fix the dishwasher. You look at the dishwasher, right? Like you don't keep scrubbing 50% of your dishes. You don't like take them out, hand wash everything, put them in. You don't keep taking the dishes, put them back in the dishwasher, press the button, think you're going to get a different result. You have to change what's happening in the dishwasher, right? So that's tiered instruction. So tier one is the dishwasher. It's okay if three to four of the plates are dirty. That's kind of like maybe you need a little extra scrub. That's fine. Maybe one or two need a deeper scrub. That's your 80 to 85%. And then your three to four dishes, or maybe your 10 to 15% can need tier two or a little extra support. And then those one to two scrubs might be our kids who need a little bit more than everybody else. But universal design and tiered instruction is looking at that whole dishwasher. All right. All right. 
Next up. All right. So have most of you have probably seen that um, MTS triangle usually is like this. It's green and there's a band of red, or sorry, yellow and then a red on the top. I don't like that triangle. Um, I like it, but I don't love it um, because it doesn't show how tier one is part of all of it. So I like this model better. It's not as pretty, but you see that the green is everything. Like universal and core instruction that tier one is everything. And then yellow is on top of that. And red is on top of that. So your student needed that intensive tier three support, which may or may not be special ed, is getting all the other pieces too. So in the analogy, dishwasher, a few dishes, a couple scrubby plates, maybe the casserole dish. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, um, I did want to point out um, one thing that is, when we think about multi-tiered or MTSS, um, sometimes we always think of, sometimes we often think of tier three as special ed. And special ed, or tier three does not have to be special ed. Really what we're learning more and more is that these tiers here, one and two, are often the classroom teacher. And that classroom teacher might be going through small groups, might have um, circle, um, sorry, small group instruction, might have reading groups going on, might be targeting kids with different skills using those formative assessments to really um, build their like literacy block or their math block or at the high school maybe a science block to get to kids in a different way, their students. And then tier three might be one-on-one -on -one, and it might be short and intensive or it might be special ed. And um, the example I would use is if you know, you're a kindergarten teacher and you have a student who um, isn't, can't hear the difference between B and B, you're mixing them up. You know? So that teacher might spend 10 minutes a day you know, going over B and V, might practice how you hold your mouth, might make the sounds, might point out down one time, or walk them through reset, at recess, point it out. And that's all that student needs. And they might need that for a few weeks, they might need it for just a few times. Um, but that one-on-one -on -one is tier three, but it didn't have to be special ed. The teacher knew what that student needed, filled in the skills, and closed that gap so that student was ready for everyone else. I would like to impress everyone know that that's a stop and a fricative. Did I do okay? Is that the difference? Mm -hmm. anyway, B and B. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Steph. A B is a sound stop and a V is a fricative. It's just one of those fun research geeky things that I like to know. Okay, moving on. Sweating. Okay. Um, components of MTSS. Um, I'm going to let you read this for just a second. I'm going to talk about each subsection. When we think about tiers of support, the first tier and one of the things we think about is a systematic and comprehensive approach. And that's really some things like your school structure and your system for addressing students. It could be your programming. It could be um, really your systems for delivery of, of, of education, of how you give that to your students, what that looks like. And then when we think uh, effective collaboration, it's fairly obvious what that looks like. Um, high quality instruction and intervention that is responsive and dif differentiated, aligned to standards, culturally sensitive, and research and evidence based. And um, much of what we're working towards is taking these pieces and having this comprehensive and balanced assessment system build for us to know how to do this work. That our assessment system will say, I've now looked at Ken's report and I have some ideas and I'm wondering, but now I have this diagnostic tool that I can look at and I'll get even more information so I can provide Ken with the skills he needs and focus on those and get him right back where he needs to be. And then expertise. I know, um, <coughs> Well, we'll come to it later, but I know that one of the things that I've heard from our teachers and um, through our data is that we are still de we are working hard to build more content knowledge, more pedagogical practices, learning how to build an MTSS system, learning how to provide intervention in a way that's going to get kids where we, we know they can be. I think that's good. 
All right. Any questions about just the the big picture of the data, the big reports? Anything stand out? Questions? Disagreements? <laughs> right. I yes. do have a question. Um, having been a mother of a former middle schooler and high schooler here at the school at, at Leon and Gray, I always wondered what happens on the other spectrum, on the kids that are not self-motivated but excel beyond the common denominator. Mm -hmm. And there was <laughs> this absolute horrendous example when my son was in the 10th grade. His social studies teacher, just at the beginning of the year, took him aside and said, I'm not going to mention his name, but I, she said, I really want you to hang in here. I know this is all below you, but I really want you to just hang in here. And that was basically it. And it aggravated me to no end. I, he asked me specifically not to get after this particular teacher, which I would have liked to strangle her. Um, she could have at least given him some challenge, because at that age, that's what he really, really needed. Being not wicked, self-motivated, and being at the age that he was. But instead, he basically just slept through the whole semester of social studies because he had to hang in there. And I find that horrendous. So I'm wondering, is there anything being done or thought about, not just trying to elevate those that are falling behind, but also to foster those that are already beyond? I, um, one, I'm sorry that that happened. That's incredibly frustrating as a parent yeah. for your child as well. And Teenagers, lack of motivation, it seems about like to go out there. And of course, he didn't want you to go. Um, I'm glad you brought it up. The second point is because um, we often, when we look at MTSS, we do focus on the intervention piece, but really, an MTS system, MTSS system provides for the enrichment piece. So if you're a tier one and everyone's giving what they need and people are solid, it allows for that tier two to be enrichment, intervention to enrichment. Um, some of our schools. And, and even tier three, if you have an incredibly, a student who needs personalized learning because they are solid and they are ready to go on, by um, designing really strong core instruction that allows for that. And that's our goal. That's our goal when we look forward to what tier two could be in our schools and how we better design MTSS systems in our schools. That is, that's right next to the intervention piece. Um, but does that mean the whole classroom has to be at a no. certain tier? No. So or like. And some of our work, and I'll come to this too, when we talk about um, professional development, a lot, like, so I'll use the example of Townsend, Craig's not here, but Townsend Elementary, their entire staff, um, including Craig, are going to a math course this summer on math workshop. And it's how to take their math curriculum, or pro, they, we don't have a set curriculum, but a, we do have a curriculum, we don't have a program, but taking their curriculum and their ideas in each grade level and differentiating that so you can have within your classroom a workshop model. So a student who is excelling within it, the teacher might be here with five kids giving them those skills that they need. There may be five kids here that are right on grade level doing the work, and there may be three over here that are enriched and doing something even greater. But all of them are getting that same core content that they're solid in, but the amount of time and the way you approach that is different. So true differentiation, true tiered instruction does all of that. It's the students who are tier one and need intensive support to the students who are, I want to do like this, students are here and need intensive support because you don't want them to be bored and they're ready for the next day. And enrichment isn't more of the same and it's not the next grade level up. It's how do you go deeper. Um, okay, so wrapping it up. Okay, thank, thank you for you. sharing that. All right, so what we know about us. <sighs> Thanks, Bill. All right, so um, I did hand out, uh, there's a, uh, you've seen this before, but uh, uh, highlights of the DMG IFR and curriculum study report that we did. Bill had me put together a, a one pager for you a while back. You use the words, not the letters. Which DMG? DMG is a district management group report. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And the IFR is an integrated field review. What's that? Nice. I like it. Okay. Uh, so, if you would please go to the next slide. From the district management group report. Um, <laughs> this is the DMG report. Um, this is from 2016 17 SBAC data. There's a couple things I want to point out. I don't typically talk in the negative, but that's how they did it. And we don't typically look at 
um, three to five, we tend to look at our elementary school or our high school or whatever um, as grade level clusters. But grades three to five is a natural cluster, both academically and developmentally. And sixth grade is the start of middle school by national standards of my common core. So when district management group comes and looks at this, they looked at three to five, which is your, your elementary years. And so what they did is they said in Vermont, 49% of students did not demonstrate proficiency in ELA in grades three through five. I'm just focusing on ELA right here, okay? So that means 51% 51 per, 51 of students got a score E3 or higher demonstrated proficiency in ESTA. For Wyndham Central that same year, 46% 40 of our students did not demonstrate proficiency in grades three to five. So 54% did demonstrate proficiency. So something to understand, the SBAC, Smarter Balanced, is um, based on the Common Core Standards. How you achieve proficiency or score a three in the SBAC is based on deciles. So in order, and it differs by grade level and by content area because of test reliability and the content areas in and reliability and all that good stuff, stats. So the fifth and sixth decile means that in order to, on average, in order to pass the SBAC, you need to show between 50 to 65% passing of your standards. So to say that again, that means to like pass or be proficient on the SBAC, you have to demonstrate understanding of 50 to 65% of the Common Core standards. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So sometimes people think like the SBAC is like you have to, like in order to pass the SBAC, you have to know every standard. 55 to 65%, 50 to 65%, depending on what grade level and content area you are. Okay. So at this point, we have 54% of our students who are able to demonstrate that. They're able to demonstrate 50% or more of the Common Core standards as measured by the SBAC. I do, um, I have broken this out for every school for grades three through five, so I can compare clusters, but because our data sets are so small, it can be challenging to do that. Um, we, at our level, we do that by grade, by school, and all that, but we can't share that. Um, this does not include Wyndham School students because their population is so small. Um, it's just very small. <laughs> Any questions about that? Oh. Great, next one, please stop. All right, um, these are recommendations from the uh, district management group report for Wyndham Central. Okay. Tier one instruction needs to meet the needs of all students. Um, best practice research shows struggling readers in the primary grades, meaning up until grade five, need 30 minutes extra time daily to catch up if they are not proficient. So if they are not demonstrating proficiency on that SBAC and on your local common assessments, by the they have 30 extra minutes per subject area that they need. Once you hit grade five and up, that jumps to 60 minutes a day. So if per subject area. So if our kids are entering seventh grade and they're not proficient, we're asking our middle school and high school teachers to take an hour out of every day to try to catch them in, catch them up. It's not impossible, it's just a lot harder. Um, and the third recommendation, Classroom teachers need expertise, content, and pedagogy to meet the diverse needs of students in tier one and one and two. Um, we know this. We know that's been shown in every report we've done. Okay, I'm getting the go, Stephanie. Tell Jen go. Step, go. Okay. No, I wasn't telling you. No, not you, Bill. <laughs> no, like I'm taking the triangle here. All right. Um, the DMG report also talked about interventionists to support two and three. Uh, small school sizes can make grouping difficult due to the limited number of students with similar needs. When you have a group of seven kids in a classroom or 15 kids in a classroom and you are trying to get to a specific <coughs> skill set, if you only have that certain skill for that one kid, it's hard to make a group, right? So if we have more students in a grade, it pulls it together. Larger schools, the inverse is true, makes it a better success. They say minimum two classes per grade was the report. Um, and that scheduling intervention, this is the Vermont statistics, um, in Vermont, the median group size is two, with 32% of time spent one-on-one. -on -one. In Vermont, over 50% of interventionist time was spent working with student groups of two or one, and they wanted us to look at scheduling as a strategic priority, which I know all of you have looked at this already. Um, okay, so that's, okay. Just a yes. Question, so 
when you say uh, intervention support at tier two and two and three, mm -hmm. now we're talking both sides of the spectrum, correct? So you said correct. earlier that you could have folks that need the extra help, or those that as the point was made earlier that are growing faster and, and need more enrichment uh, because they're excelling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is that's a great distinction because this is also about when they speak of intervention, they're not talking about a classroom teacher intervention. They're talking about specialists, reading and math specialists and enrichment specialists that can really provide that extra support. And that does include special ed in there as well. Make sense? Okay. Anything else about okay. integrated field review or the IFR report? Um, these were their recommendations from uh, professional for professional learning. Um, this is so. Read it here, but I'll say to you, this is consistent what we've learned in the last 18 months to two years that we've studied the work that we're doing in our SU. This is consistent. We need help with MTSS. We need professional learning about pedagogy, how to provide intervention, how to meet the needs of our students. Um, data and the use of data in this last year. Um, I am going to send huge kudos to all of our teachers right now. Um, they have really, for the most part, people have really started looking at data and saying, what do I know about me? What do I know about our students? How can I make it better? We are, have no shortage of teachers who care deeply about our students. There's no doubt. And what we can do for that is help them have the skills and the content knowledge and the pedagogical practices and those high quality instructional practices to help our kids get better. And they need help with that. And before you go on, yes. So I just had a little sidebar with Al here. Yes. And remember, I did graduate from Newland Gray at one point. Yes, sir. <laughs> Pedagogical or ped pedagogy is the teaching of students, young yeah. children, or children under the age of eighteen. Andragogy is the teaching of adults. Okay. Thank you. Do I know that fricatives and stuff? No. JB right. <laughs> <laughs> never told me those terms. So no. No. Sorry. Any <laughs> rest in peace. Thank you. Absolutely. So really working at this, it's why aren't we doing it? Because time, scheduling, resources, multi-grade, multi-age can be really challenging for some of our teachers, well, for all of our teachers. It should be some. It's uh, how do you differentiate? How do you meet the needs of all the kids? How do you do everything in a school day? Um, and then how are you an expert? Um, I think of some of our multi-grade kids, teachers, and I'm like, how do you know one through two content all the differentiation within each of those for the kids of what they need, all the different skills, how you use your pedagogical practices and best instructional practices to reach the kids who are in that 15% that need something different. How you do that for every subject level, every subject, all day long, for all the kids, all year long. It's, our teachers work incredibly hard. And it's not for a lack of effort, it is for a lot of other reasons. Thank you. Right from the <laughs> IFR, assess our fidelity of our tier one programming instruction, provide instruction in tiered support system, and use data to inform and adjust instruction, um, and continue to build on early efforts to coordinate curriculum across the SU. Um, we don't need more of the same, we need more time, we need more skills and ways to hone in on what that tier two looks like and what our tier one looks like to meet the needs of all of our kids on the whole spectrum. Um, Speaking of this, which I am speaking of, um, continue to build on early efforts to coordinate curriculum across the WCSU. Our teachers, our elementary teachers this year, and middle and high school are next. Um, we worked really hard, and they really dedicated a lot of time. The blue document in front of you, there's a few of them out here, um, are what they came up with. So in mathematics, our teachers this year looked at pre-K to, pre to six, and they came up with a scope and sequence for math instruction. They did it through um, the PD we've been doing this year, the professional development, um, we've got a lot of activities and resources to do that. Teachers looked at how to look at problem solving, how to make inquiry based um, problems and questions in math. They uh, did the depth of knowledge, higher order thinking, and they took this and they took their current, you know, the Common Core standards, current different programs that schools are working on, and they collaborated and they came up with a document that they all voted on that they can live on, live with. It's good for new teachers. It will help them multigrade. It will help them in the classroom. They have a time calendar, and they're working from it. And I'm just, um, it's great. And like, uh, they've worked their tails off to get here. So if you see one, tell them, see a teacher, tell them thank you, because that was a ton of work. Um, and we hope to do that with other content areas, too, knowing it's a living document. So. Okay. 
I'm going to skip the golf analogy. Thank goodness. Bill challenges me to have analogies, um, and I, I get that. Um, but then he always has sports analogies, and I am not. I have to, I, that long PG song for me is me like trying to remember what a draw is when you're playing golf. I don't. It's very challenging for me, so I'm very happy to skip it. Um, I will show you this. So this is Colorado's MTSS model, um, completely stolen from them. They have, it's a mountain, looks a little like a volcano, but it's, this is their MTSS for their state. What? I thought it was a volcano. I know, right? But it's Colorado, so that makes sense. Um, but I, what I do like about this um, graphic is that it, it's a circle, and it talks about the pieces that make multi-tiered system support. So moving out of that granular of the classroom into what it really looks like, what MTSS is, it's a system. Um, MTSS has strong and collaborative leadership, um, distributed leadership at the top and throughout the whole system, so everyone is part of it. Um, there's a sustained focus over time. Um, I'm talking about characteristics of effective systems, which is also in your presentation. But there's a um, sustained focus over time that we don't jump back and forth, but we look at our data, we move forward, we tweak, we move again. Um, it is um, a partnership with families, schools, and communities. It has to do with behavior. It's not just academic. It's talking about how we support all behaviors. I think about the work we're planning to do around trauma, um, and becoming trauma-transformed schools. It's these pieces fit together. Some of our schools are PBIS. Um, Evidence-based practices. Um, some of this comes from the state level. We are, I've been ordered to use grant funds. We look at evidence, and we look at evidence-based practices and research practices in order to use those funds. But it really is looking at that whole idea of what do we know, how do we identify those skills and what's needed, prescriptive and diagnostically addressing those skills in order to give kids what they need so they can excel. Um, Database problem solving and decision making, uh, layered continuums of support that are both for behavior and for academics. Um, your next slide, the next slide, Steph, is just what I talked about, but it also talks about the, the piece that isn't in Colorado's is the articulation and alignment of curriculum and instruction that we are headed in the same direction together. And under that shared vision, we're professionally collaborating and sharing knowledge. Any questions about MTSS? Multi-tier system support, universal design? OK. Uh, so next slide, please, Steph. Okay. Um, what is in our control? And I think this is a really important one to put in there because there's so many things that are happening in our, in our world and in our students' world that are out of our control. But we do know these are things we can do. Um, structures and systems, that's your bells and schedules, your skills, your specialists, your, it's your personnel, um, how you structure classrooms. Um, <laughs> high expectations, um, throw out a little, John Hattie is, uh, does meta-analysis research from his most recent update is 2017, it was 2009, does like, I think it's over 50,000 surveys, um, I'm sorry, research studies incorporated, and he talks about effect size, so how much one thing affects another. So high expectations, um, teacher expectations, sorry, okay. <laughs> teacher expectations has, it, um, has a 0 .41 effect size on student achievement. That's huge. So we have a high expectations. Um, consistency and quality of instruction, um, also Hattie's work. PD, professional development for teachers, is a point, I'm sorry, t teacher expectation is point for four three. Um, PD is point four one. So another huge relation, correlation between those two. Um, agreement on instruction, both vertically and horizontally across the SU. We can do that. We're making progress already. Um, systems to support positive school climate. We have that started. We're looking at um, going even wider and, and reaching everyone and how we can build that as a whole issue. And then materials and resources. As a board, you have much more um, probably oversight over that than I ever do. But that's what that is. When I think about what we have control over, I think about what we have power over. When I say we, I mean me. I mean all of you, the principals, the teachers, our family members. Like we have control over this. We can influence this. We talked a lot about Common Core, common assessments, how we make instructional decisions around tiered instruction, how we adjust those um, instruction to fit the needs of our students, and how we know our students. And this is, again, a huge, 
huge strength of our SU is how we know our kids personally and what we can do for them. And we factor in that social emotional. And um, I, I say this all the time, it's we figure out their barriers and we help to take those barriers down. It's not enough just to see like a student living in trauma or a student has these barriers to them. It's our job to figure out how to take those barriers down and give them skills, just like we would do academically. All right, so what are we going to do about it? <laughs> so um, we've learned a lot. We had a curriculum study, integrated field review, the DMG, um, our observations, teacher feedback, PD feedback, principals have given feedback. Um, we have all this stuff, all these things that we are now looking at to say, okay, what does all of this tell us? What are our consistencies? Where do we want to go? Um, Go ahead, Seth. I think later on Bill is going to share the CIP, uh, the Continuous Improvement Plan, uh, that has been updated. It's already out, okay? And that really reflects this work. Um, these are all, everything is tied together. So what do we know we need to do? There's, um, one of our categories is professional development. We know we need to do this. Um, pedagogical and content knowledge. We need um, continuity and collaboration across the SU. Um, we need shared knowledge and vocabulary and models. One of the greatest things that um, I've had the privilege of get to do this last year is work with our teachers during these five PD days and then afterwards in grade level meetings and listen to them share content knowledge and also say, oh, I tried this resource, what can we do? And I didn't understand that. Being able to like be that vulnerable with one another and, and collaborate is just huge. It's just, it's such a sign of a healthy, a healthy issue and a healthy group of teachers that want to move forward. Um, Deeper understanding of tier support system. I think I've drilled that in pretty hard. A deeper understanding of personalized proficiency-based programming at the high school. I would also throw in understanding how to teach adolescents and young adolescents for the middle and high school, because that's a whole other follow-up. Um, strategies to understand and address challenging behaviors and bringing down those barriers uh, for students living in trauma. Um, we all need to become interventionists for social, emotional, and academic. And we need to figure out how to do that well. And that comes from four one. So, thinking of next year, um, on the, I know we have, I can talk a little bit more about it, but if you aren't aware that we are um, working with NFI, uh, oh boy, what does NFI stand for? Northeast, Northeast Family, Family Institute. Institute. Dave Melnick is coming to work with us um, to help bring us forward in our trauma-informed schools work. Go ahead, Seth, I can, turn. I can skip the next part. Uh, Data-driven instruction, so professional development, data-driven instruction. Um, again, we've worked so hard already. The teachers are um, on board really looking at the data. We have Ames Web and Star 360 in place, and we have a whole LCAS system or local common assessment system. Um, those are screeners. They flag. So we know, hmm, kid's not doing so well on this. He didn't hit the benchmark. That's not enough. Like, now we need to say, okay, why? And then that should flag us to think of something else that we want to know more of. Could have just had a bad day. Like, really, you know, kid who's moving along pretty well doesn't score so well, there might be something else that's going on. But there might be a lot more. So we need to figure out, diagnostic and prescriptively, what those skills are that we need to address, and then address them. Um, next piece, a diagnostic assessment to provide prescriptive response to students who are lacking from foundational skills, and clear criterion of how students will demonstrate proficiency. When is it enough? When are they, when are they good? And I can say, we're working on it. This, like, we would like to have an assessment toolkit. We have a lot more work to do around this area. One step at a time. Um, this year, um, too, with our data, we've been able um, at the school level, but then also um, I get to work with academic support teachers um, once a month, and we spend time looking at data, but then we also spend a lot of time talking about how you build in those skills, what tier instruction looks like for intervention. Um, our pre K, K, and 1 are looking at our assessments that we're currently using and we're piloting some things this year by their request to see if there's a better tool for the early kids because it's so critical. And they took that all on themselves. They are, I'm helping them, but it was all their idea. I said, it means you're doing double. And they're like, but we might have better information and help more kids. Okay, that's it. Uh, the third thing, so professional development, data-driven instruction, and then positive school climate. And this is a big focus. You'll see it is one of our CIP goals. Um, working, um, starting out with really looking at trauma-informed schools, 
We're really also looking, working with like PBIS and the PBIS coaching. Some of our schools are working with the Bell Center about behavior supports and understanding functions of behavior. How we help our kids be socially and emotionally healthy. Um, and that ties into um, the BEST grant, pre-K expansion grant, Title I grant. Um, other thoughts? Okay. So that is it. One more slide? Uh, Final thoughts. Yes. So besides the SBAC, uh, what are some of the other things that you will be able to show us for results that have moved in the um, So besides the SBAC, which is our subject <coughs> test, we have Ames Web, um, which is a K through 8, three times a year. We do a benchmark screener. Uh, which is in ELA, English Language Arts, and Math. So we can show you that data. Um, we can also show you, um, it's called DIBBLES, uh, Dynamic Indicators of Early. Basic and Early. Basic, I was going to be, Basic Early Learning. Uh, so we do that um, starting in the end of K and into two. Um, and then at the high school level, from ninth and, ninth and tenth grade, we use something called STAR 360, which is also a three times a year benchmark. Um, and then past that, um, our we are using some tools like um, our early, the ones I talked about the early childhood, they're using a couple other tools to do that. One thing to uh, make note of, of uh, Ames Web, we were using the 30th, 30th percentile, percentile as our cut for proficiency, and that's a national. Um, and we're moving it up to 50th percentile. Um, and that came from the teachers. They felt like the bar was too low, that um, it wasn't getting us our students where they needed to go, and it was kind of giving us false, like, false positives that we felt great, but we need to move our kids strong. Yeah. That's great. So we can see that next time? Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And any school has that. Like every, every school has that by grade level and everything. So Does, do you show trending as well? So like here's before we made some changes to the MTSS. At the school level. And now here's where we're at as a result of <laughs> things that we've done, recommendations we've followed. Mm -hmm. That's a great, that's great. Yes, we could do that. That. I would always like to see the results. Of Absolutely. So the only difference would be when we move to the 50th percentile, it's going to look a little rough in the, in the fall. Uh, but yes, as we're making gains, like so, I'll use Newbrook as an example. Like Newbrook has used their Ames Web data to look just at their math instruction because we've done all this work in Math PD and they're seeing the growth and they're targeting that and they're attributing it to the math we're doing. And then our younger grades at Newbrook again, looking at early literacy, so the pre-K expansion grant work that we do and seeing that growth. Absolutely. Great question. So my final thoughts, we, this journey we're on, we are learning a lot. Our teachers are, and all of us are working really hard and I think we're working smart and it's great and it's, um, it's a real gift to get to work with people like our teachers because um, they care so much, they're dedicated to it, they're reflective, they're thinking about the practice. And we have bright expectations that I feel really positive. So thank you all for your support. I'm sorry for how I did for time. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any yeah. other questions for um, for our four subsection A? No. My subsection A. <laughs> your subsection A. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Thank you. That's not really good. Yes. How about the subsection B? So we have a, a legislative update. So I think because they came in late, um, we got. Um, I always have said that I feel very fortunate in this district because I think it's one of the few. We actually have three legislators in our area, um, and there's a fourth one with Stratton and um, I think Jamaica, and I don't remember that district. But three of our, uh, out of the schools that we're all involved in, um, three out of, um, we have three legislators that actually serve on the board, and they kind of, they came in late because they were up in most peculiar today, so you guys got to introduce yourself to the camera. Uh, Emily Long, Lauren Dover. So we've got we put in a legislative update because there's a lot of stuff going on. So Carolyn said that she had a hearing or something, or she was doing something tomorrow at, in Montpelier for the legislature. The only thing she just wanted to bring up, she felt that Emily and Laura would cover most of the educational stuff, is that the I guess this year in her committee they did do an extra. Um, they get a commitment for an extra fifty thousand from farm to school, so there's a, like a total of one hundred eighty thousand. They had it roughly one hundred to one hundred thirty-five, and I don't know if that's is that been signed off or is that part of the whole budget package? Yeah, it's part of the budget package. Yeah, 
You know, I don't know if that's been signed yet. Like 37 bills went on on t Tuesday to the governor, so I, I haven't kept track of which one that is. He has five days to sign them. After he gets them. So that was the only thing she had, and then she felt that you know with Emily being on Ed and. And Laura, um, who really pays a lot of attention to that, and had a couple issues with the, or a couple bills before some educational stuff, that they would be able to give us a better presentation. So you guys can pick who goes first. And, you know, I guess Emily's going to. I am like, I, I'm so road buzzing that I probably shouldn't go first. Um, what do you want to know? We, so, just, we just met today. And we don't have any bills signed. Um, we don't. The big bill isn't signed for budget, so we don't know where our budget's going to fall yet. Right. Um, actually, neither of them. I think them is going to be one's veto. Isn't it? No, I don't think we have. I don't think we have vetoes yet. They will be vetoed. Um, but so we're operating as if they were being rejected. Um, and so today, um, we, Laura and I both said in on testimony from the Joint Fiscal Office on the governor's proposal. Uh, we also had um, the administration gave gave the proposal to us. Were you there for that whole thing? Yes. <laughs> it was um, quite interesting. Yes. And, and we should both share our thoughts on that. Um, I did see Laura across the room and was very glad she was there so she could back me up. It was, it was a lot of surprise, um, I think, from legislators in the room. Uh, honestly, on the lack of um, Sharpness. <laughs> That's her word, not mine. Um, on the on the lack of research and the lack of analysis done on the proposal, the the lack of preparedness for responding to our questions. I think um, the the doubling down on we're just going to use one-time money flat to uh, keep property tax rates uh, level. Uh, there, you know, folks need to understand that the governor has made a very clear statement that he doesn't want to see any increased taxes or fees in any bills, and he's told us pretty clearly from the beginning of the year that he wasn't going to, they, he wouldn't support any bills that came through with increased fees or taxes. Um, we tried to point out to him today that even his proposal has, creates an increase in taxes for uh, 127 school districts in the state of Vermont. Um, and they, they said, yes, that's true, um, it does, but, but it's a lower increase than what um, folks would have felt anyway, so they felt that that was okay. So I heard today they, they also passed, you were in there when they said they passed another bill that had an increase in some fee. That surprised me too, I didn't know what that was. They, they oh, said he signed JFO. something. It was um, the reduction in the, um, I can't remember. It'll come to you. Yes. It'll, it'll come to you probably quicker Income than Income sensitivity. It's a reduction in income sensitivity. Um, between nine, folks are earning 90 and 147, oh, yeah. which they originally had thought that they would be okay with, but then saw, it as, saw that as a tax increase on folks in that, potential tax increase for folks in that tax rate. So, it's a little bit all over the place, I would say, um, the, the administration's proposal. Um, and the numbers uh, the numbers are a little bit all over the place. We're, you know, we had a presentation today where we were hearing phrases like, you know, it's in the high 400,000s, um, which is interesting when we convene the legislature for a session and do not have more precise numbers. That was my reference to sharpness. Um, I think the, I mean, really the big, I think the gov my biggest challenge with what the governor's proposing is um, relying on potential savings from mandated ratios, um, and... Although he's not really saying they're mandated now, he's just saying that they're targets and that we were going to meet them yes. so that we can mitigate the one-time money put in. He, he has backed off on the yes. mandate yes. for it. Yes, but it's a very large amount of the of the saving. It's the largest part of the savings that are being projected. Um, 
and we're also looking at a pretty significant ratcheting down of the excess spending penalty. <coughs> I almost jumped out of my chair hearing uh, a legislator from Chicken County stand up and say, that could be very significant for some of our rural districts. How did you arrive at that number? I mean, that would be adequate. <laughs> so I'm not really sure where um, where the wiggle room is. Um, I mean, there is some. There does that 32 million in the tobacco settlement seems to be a place that you know there could be. So the 32 million in the tobacco was already um, that money was money that we. Um, <coughs> felt it was better used in other places right. than artificially lowering property tax rates. Um, teachers, reti teachers retirement or property tax rates. I mean, those things seem like more more arguable than some of the other things are. I, you know, they seem more arguable and cut and dry than some of this other stuff. It's kind of pasted together and really hard to follow. I think it's really important, at large just brought it up, and I think it's really important. I mentioned it at our uh, West River meeting on Monday night and it did come out again today, that excess spending threshold going down to 110% is huge. Um, and, and something that I just am really surprised. For, for anyone who doesn't think that this is a, t a, a cap on education spending, it is. A, a, as well as these tax rates are a cap on education spending. And you know, whether you agree with the decision that the legislature made a couple years ago when they removed the allowable growth cap on education spending from Act 46 the following year after Act 46 passed, um, that did happen and there was a reason for it. There was an outcry from school board members all over the state and from communities all over the state telling legislators they weren't okay with a cap on that spending. So we haven't done that. This is a, I, a, we're definitely heading back in that direction. And I'll just say, from my own personal perspective, and Laura may have a different one, but I doubt it, because she's been a pretty dedicated school board member for a long time. I feel this is a real threat to local decision making, local control over our schools, and against public education in general. And it really concerns me a lot. Um, and I think we need to be very vigilant in our, um, the work we do as school board members, I think we need to be very vigilant in our communication with our communities because 97% of our school budgets this year passed. And that says something to me as a, as a legislator and, and certainly as a, as a Vermonter and a school board member that there's support for the work we're doing. And the governor said 2.5% uh, was okay with him and we came in at 1.7 um, increase in education for people spending. Um, and I think school boards and their communities are doing a really good work and they're doing the job that has been asked of them. They're working their way, slogging through Act 46 to find a path um, to get out to the other side. They are seeing some of those earlier districts that have merged are really looking hard at their student staff ratios and doing what they can to, through attrition or whatever way, um, to address those, those issues. And I think that we are fully capable of making those decisions ourselves between our school boards and our communities. So, I, hey, hang on one second, please. Hang on. Are you all set? Okay. Yeah. Can you guys hear okay over there? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you had to change over. Really, really, okay. I I would just you know adding on to this, this is something that I'm trying to really call out as part of this discussion. Um, these, particularly the ratios and the ratcheting down of the excess spending are so um, potentially catastrophic, really, for rural and smaller districts. Um, I understand uh, the, the administration is trying to get some accountability on the education fund, but you can't be just accountable for the education fund and not accountable when you're making those kind of changes for what's happening to kids. And so one of the things that I am saying is if that's the route you're going, then it's time to talk about a state takeover of all the schools because then you need to be accountable for what is happening with those dollars and making sure that equity is happening because when you make those kind of changes, they're so unpredictable out in our districts. Um, you know, there's no way to really understand at a state level how that's going to impact kids. So. Um, and they haven't done the analysis to find out. Because yeah. I've asked them that, yeah. and they don't know 
why some districts have yeah. lower and, and some others have higher student staff yeah. ratios. They don't know why. And fundamentally, I think that um, the work, the level of change that is happening in Vermont's education <coughs> system right now through Act 46 <coughs> is so, uh, it's huge. And it takes so much time, just what's happening now. Um, and this, I understand wanting to get after property tax rates, but I would also say, you know, the administration was in no hurry last year to do the waiting study, which we all agreed to, and that would be very helpful in, you know, in an interim way in terms of ratcheting down on property taxes. So, um, you know, stay tuned. I, I'm not sure how this, I really don't see the, the place in the middle here. You know, as I said, I'm trying to think about, you know, what things seem at least to be understandable in terms of differences of opinion. So there does seem to be, it just it's worth noting that there does seem to be some division within the Republican Party around whether they support the governor's proposal or not, and I don't know whether you were there, but I wasn't, but I knew what was happening. There was a, a press conference held by some, by the minority leader and a few members of the Republican caucus um, presenting their own proposal on education spending. So, so Scott Beck had a proposal along with Dom and uh, a Dom. number of them. Yeah. I, I, I have Beck's looked at it. I'll, I'll say it to you. I, I have looked at it. I'm not exactly thrilled with it either. But it, yeah. but it does show a division going on even in the Republicans on whether they can support uh, the governor's proposal. There's clearly um, unhappiness in a lot of ways. But because Laura's right, we don't know how we're going to get out of this because the governor is basically just saying to us, no. I'm, we're not. I'm not going to change my mind about this. Why? Yeah, the presentation right. today. I, I was in there saying, why? Why did I travel to Montpelier to see this? Because I mean, it's not a thing. So besides that section, it's, <laughs> it's pretty big. Because we're we're also running out of time. So yeah. I, so quickly, uh, uh, special ed. Did, does everybody know about that? Special Ed Bill, it has not, I don't believe it's been signed yet, but it will, I think, be signed because, again, uh, as part of the proposal that the governor put out, he put out our proposal on um, special education. That passed both bodies and um, with, with almost unanimous support throughout, with a lot of support throughout the um, state from education leaders and even from our own, I believe, education leader. And, and I think it's a really good bill, and it's one of the, you know, Laura does this even more than I, and she's absolutely right. We, we put a lot of mandates on school districts um, nearly every year, and we are trying to be very conscious of that. That was the only bill that came out of education this year, and there were some folks in the agency who said to me, thank you for not dumping a whole bunch of other stuff on us this year. This is a significant change. It will, um, you'll be hearing about it from our folks here uh, for years to come. We, the Senate took out the early um, adopters, so we are not early adopters, even though we would have been early adopters. There are none. So it's 2021 um, when, when the funding change happens, going from reimbursement to census block. But I know the work is already ongoing, and you probably talked about it already. No, no we have it in uh, Oh, it's on the agenda? Yeah. Oh, great. So great. Marlboro, this is what when we reorganized, we said we would discuss the special ed stuff, and this is probably going to take that away from us because it's they're going to mandate how it goes anyways. Yeah. So my only thought was is we're going to have a little bit of a presentation tonight, and then when that's over, we should have a discussion that if we want to, because I you guys gave me permission to appoint a committee. And I appointed a bunch of it. You just don't know it yet. Um, <laughs> no, you're the chairman. <laughs> and, I'm winning, no. And um, so one of the things is I figured we could talk about um, that in the special ed. It hasn't been signed yet. There's no reason to believe it wouldn't be signed, except I just said, you know, in political che chess and checkers or whatever, is that going to be something that's going to get pulled off? So until it's actually signed, or like Yogi Bear said, until it's, it's over and ain't over, um, but I think we should talk about that after Bill gets, or the special ed. Is there anything else for the two legislators that are here? Has there been anything? Maybe I missed it, but on the, uh, <laughs> the private uh, funding of public dollars and special education, is that in the special education section? So there's this, there is a piece of it in, spe in the special ed bill um, about independent schools 
being required to accept all students, including those who are on special ed. You know, some of the largest ones, Burn Burton, St. Jay, Lynn Institute, that do pretty much accept them all anyway, but small ones don't, and so that was included in the special ed bill. Um, there was a little bit of a, uh, you might be thinking of the other um, private school piece, which was in the miscellaneous ed bill, which was um, limiting dollars leaving the state only to those contiguous to Vermont and, and including Canada. That did not make it out of conference committee, so that did not pass. Uh, Doug, that's on page 19. Okay. Like that. Starting in the middle, going for about two pages. So, is there anything else for the legislators? We can ask them if they'll promise us that chicken in every pot, maybe go over it the next No problem. <laughs> but thank you for guys for running down and doing that. So, we'll move on to we have our business manager presentation. All right. Um, so, I'm going to be quick tonight. Okay, we'll be bored with the money here. So uh, WCSU's general fund uh, began fiscal year 17 with a fund balance of about 339,000. The general fund balance actually decreased 21,000 and the decrease was due to some unresolved issues on our balance sheet that went back to fiscal year 15, so we had to take care of. So a little bit of a loss there, but the special revenue fund, which is our grant fund, uh, started the year with about $10,000, and we increased that by $44,000, so um, that helped. Of course, it's those are restricted funds. They need to be used for each grant. Um, so overall, the, the fund balance did increase to about $400,000. Did you give us something? Not yet. I'm just, just telling you about the audit. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking for something. I can't find it. Well, could. you have audits on your table there, and uh, so feel free to take that booklet home and study it. And email me any questions that you have. There'll be a test at the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to be quick. I was told to be quick here. Um, so. Uh, as as I told you, I think maybe at the last meeting, I was putting the audit um, out to bid uh, for fiscal year 18, 19, and 20. Uh, the proposal came back, and we actually are switching auditors um, for savings of around $17,000 overall. Uh, and then in fiscal year 20, when the mergers happen, it'll be an additional $15,000 savings. So. By fiscal year 20, we're looking at about $32,000 savings over what we're paying currently as a whole. Okay, so the proposed uh, the award went to RHR Smith and Company, and uh, he gets great. I got some great feedback from other business managers that use him. So, um, business office news. Uh, so. As I've t also told you before, there's a statewide accounting system that we are putting into play. Um, this is actually part of a mandate, too, um, I believe, and I'm not sure if that was passed or not, but yes. there was length, it was passed? Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. Okay. So um, we are starting the implementation for that uh, new accounting system that will go live on 7-1 with the Birch districts and single districts. Um, but in June and July, we've got about seven days of training, and then in January through um, June 30th, we'll have our intensive implementation time. So, so we're busy. Um, along with that, we have a new grants management system that we've been getting trained in that needs to go live on uh, July 1st this year. And then we'll be starting, of course, the merger work for the two new boards. So I just want to reinforce, so we have an entirely new financial management system, an entirely new grants management system, at the same time merging 10 separate districts into four organizations. That's all flowing through the business office right now. It is an unbelievably busy time. And so we're also finishing up fiscal year 18's work as well um, to get prepped for new auditors. Um, you all got the check register that was from the last meeting on. Okay. So I'm going to I'm gonna sort of go into special ed and explain. You do have handouts for these. These are the two <laughs> handouts. Um, which, which 
the, the ones of the colored graphs. One says occupational. Yes. Okay. Early childhood. One is early childhood special education, and the other one is occupational therapy. So Steph and I have been working together. Stephanie, sorry, Stephanie and I have been working together um, to talk about next year and where we are with special education. And um, if you look at the first one, which is the early childhood, I'm going to let Stephanie um, talk about the services and that type of thing. But if you turn to the graph, I just want to explain the graph to you. <coughs> so this is, this is our trending that is happening. Um, and, and what we're really trying to point out here is the triple E. So our child count in fiscal year 16, which the child count, if you, if you don't know what it is, it's the, it's the report that gets sent to the state that counts all the special ed in our district. Um, and then you can see we did a child count in fiscal year 17. And then we do the service plan for fiscal year 19, which is actually done in 17. Um, so this is the plan. This is what's in your budgets for fiscal year 19. Okay, that's, that's what the budgets are based on. And then we do another child count in December. And then we have what we're actually anticipating starting in September of um, 18. So you can see that the triple E has gone from five students, basically, you know, all the way up. Um, to 27. 27, and actually, that's mm -hmm. the last count she uh, had was before I or after I did this graph. So uh, we are in need of another uh, triple E teacher. Um, so Steph, you can talk about this. Sure. Um, so if you look at the bullet points on the first page, um, I first want to preface, though, that we don't try to increase staff unless we have to. Um, our early childhood special educator's um, current caseload is 29, and when I emailed her today to check back in, there have been six more screening referrals. Um, there's a lot, a lot going on in early childhood, which is great given Jen's slide showing that you know, early intervention is key and it's less expensive to do early intervention than it is later on because it takes less time. Um, the average caseload size for an early childhood special educator is 14, so you can see our four early childhood special educator finally waved her white flag to say that she needed help, <laughs> and I'm glad she did. <laughs> um, so you've seen the trends on the, um, the graph. It has increased in size uh, pretty significantly uh, year over year. The current staffing that we have for professional staff, we have one early childhood special, special educator, and we have one early childhood special education um, services instructional interventionist. The instructional interventionist helps with the actual uh, you know, hands-on um, instruction of the children, and uh, the early childhood special educator is you know, responsible for uh, progress monitoring for federal and state, um, checking in with uh, programs, doing uh, direct observations of students, guiding processes, helping with outside agencies, really um, intervening as much as she can to guide the instruction. She also <coughs> does direct instruction with students, and she does all of our evaluations for early childhood. Um, Another challenge that we have with these positions is that they are traveling to uh, 25 different sites because they do all the outside, um, wherever people decide to place their children um, for pre-K or any of those kinds of experiences. They have to travel to each one to get to know kids, work for them, get to know the systems. And uh, that can result in up to 10 hours a week of travel, which is um, difficult <laughs> to deal with in any of our related service providers are experiencing that. Um, and so as when we looked at all of the data, we felt that we really need to hire another early childhood special educator who will take on half of the case management and make it so that things can be a little bit more efficient and manageable and be aligned with what other districts are doing for caseload size. So. Um, and then if you look at the next uh, graph, on the occupational therapy. Um, this is also, you know, it's the same same thing, different service, basically. Um, the OT 
went from uh, 22 evaluations to 60 this year currently and the re what I did in the second graph down here is the referral source because it's always interesting to find out where are these referrals coming from so you know 22 percent of the 60 were move-ins we couldn't do anything about those happens right 57 percent are, are case managers and teachers that are referring um, you know anywhere and these are all of her referrals all the OT referrals so um, could, those could range from pre-k to 12th grade so that again is another reason we need a coda and what is a coda a coda I'm sorry it says it on here certified occupational therapy assistant so uh, our OTR will do evaluations mm -hmm. right but the coda the CODAs do the actual um, direct service, yeah. And again, that's another challenge is that they're going to so many locations and spending so much time traveling that it's, you know, it's hard to have one person do all of those things. Um, the reason that we're bringing this to you, not only because it's <coughs> additional staffing that you will be billed for, so this is it. This is out of the plan. This is additional staff. So we'll have to you know, work it through the um, special education budget, revenues, and all of that because we're still in a reimbursement model. But as we know, we're, we're headed towards a census-based model. But it's important to look at these because, because of that. Because in 2021, we will get so much per student. And that's it not a reimbursement model at that point so it's important to understand where we are with triple E um, and early education and additional services as we look to this is the flat amount that you're going to get and then anything above that is local dollars is what local dollars local. So I don't know if you want to talk more about the OT, but I think that kind of lays it all out here pretty clearly. <laughs> the numbers talk. That's what we try to. Yeah. You know, we make it a logical process. Um, but happy to answer any questions you guys have. Question. Uh, this may not uh, actually. The legislators may know better than than you folks about this. But if when we do go to the census model in 2021, uh, is that based on? Uh, past expenses within the districts or the supervisory unions uh, in other words might <clears throat> some districts or, or supervisory unions get a higher amount per student or is that going to just be one figure statewide or? so if you go to your handy dandy mm -hmm. education oh, yeah. legislative yeah. report and go to page 13 um, it will tell you the down and dirty details but Lori's very good at telling you in one minute how that's going to play. Okay. That's All right. Watch. So it's not based on expenses, but it's based on what we've gotten for reimbursements for 18, 19, and 20. And then it's averaged. Okay. And then that's divided by our long term membership, which is ADM, over three years as well. And then that is your um, cost, per, or not your cost per student, that's your um, allocation per student. Then in 2025, um, is their target, right? And I'm making sure I'm getting the nods over here. But in 2025, uh, there is going to be what they call a uniform base amount. And basically from 2021 to 2025, we're gonna be stepping down to that uniform base amount. Or stepping or up. Stepping or up. stepping up. Depends Sorry. on where you are. Right. Yeah, right, it depends on where you are. Towards that amount. Yes. Correct. Yeah, that's right. We're only going to spend that amount in 2025, right? That's the goal. Because, yeah, it's significant for us. And, um, it's, well, the, the amount that we get will be coming down. Yeah. We're a high well, compared to right movies. now. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what it's going to be compared to because all our professional development is going to do such wonderful things, our costs are going to be that's cut right. in half. But that's why we that's have to, years. it's imperative that we build up our MTSS and have effective instruction for every kid because then we're really only looking at 15% who need the specialized instruction, so our special ed costs will go down. 
some of our locations are at 24% right now, so you can kind of see if you took off the 15%, you have a you know, small section that would need teacher intervention that would be already embedded in your budget with your regular ed teacher. So. You're such an optimist. I am, you know I always Such a what? I plan oh, for the worst. Oh, my, this is my motto, plan for the worst, okay. hope for the oh, best. Okay, I'm sorry. Yes. So, so just, can I, oh, sorry, can I just finish up yeah. one, my one minute? I took a pause in there. So, <laughs> just so you understand too how this works, it comes into the district as the um, total amount. So it's whatever the ADM is divided by the, um, our reimbursement over three years. So how it goes out, I don't know. That's up to you. But right now, for the, the problems you're projecting to us now with the additional needs, that still gets to be evened up when the stat report's filed in August. So or it would be filed when the stat report's filed for the following year. Well, it's the, so, it's the special ed report. Right, and but it, it's all, so, just because we're hiring more people, you're recommending to hire more people that we didn't budget for, it doesn't mean that there isn't any funds available because we're still under the old model. Right? Yes, right. right. This is, we're so still people under just need to understand it's not all doom and gloom. Right. The state, as long as the state passes a budget and passes the budget. <laughs> These then, two positions will be reimbursed at 56%. Right, which is better than nothing. <laughs> By 56%. Only if you're an out chemist or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, right. Good point. But Bill points out to me that the special, the triple E teacher is not reimbursed. Yeah. Right. We get a flat triple E. Yeah, which is very, very little. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thanks. Any of that? Well, hey, now, hang on. Sorry. He actually had a stand up, so we're going to have to. So mine's more just because we have you here, Stephanie. I want to talk more. I mean, these are you're giving us numbers, which is great. But I think when I look at these numbers, there's a story behind them. And what I hear and what I see is, you know, we have a shrinking student population, but we have an ever increasing. I mean, 50%. It looks like in Triple E just this last year. I was doing some quick fact sheet math. You know, since you know the last three years, it was 19%. So. What's the story with a shrinking population of students, but a rising, co like a rising <coughs> special ed students? And what you know, you don't have to give me details, but I want to know what that story is and where the concern is. And is, I know that it's statewide, and I know that a lot of it's related to opioid crisis. But like, what's the end game? And and, and is there a talk about that, and not just funding? But absolutely. Um, so part of the story is uh, well, one piece that, as you said, we are aligned with what other state, uh, other school districts around the state are seeing in trends. Um, so what we're experiencing as far as the increase in special ed for early childhood <coughs> is right aligned with all of our neighboring districts. Um, I think what the story is, um, and it's not necessarily a bad thing, is that we have a lot of different providers with a lot of different styles. Yet special education has this set criteria of 40% delay in the developmental domain, or two standard deviations, or one and a half in two areas. There's strict criteria, and I think the more educated we get on childhood development, and the more aligned we get, the more we're seeing possibly that we're not quite meeting the needs of all of our students. So I think if we can get to a point where we're more preventative and more you know, creating universally designed instruction for these guys, I think we won't have to identify them, so we won't have to have our numbers look like they're going up. It would be the standard 33 to 40 students per year, um, not specially, just total uh, number. Um, I also think it, there, there are some concerns with opioid crisis and different kinds of um, socioeconomic challenges, um, but I do feel that it, it's just it's just a it's, a, it's a combination of factors, and there's not one particular thing you can pull apart and prevent. I think it's the knowledge we have. We're catching kids early, and we're intervening early, and hopefully we're part of that 41% that they can get off and exit. Um, we have had quite a few success stories where kids are exiting um, when they're going from the um, early childhood level to the uh, school-aged IEP level. When we do that evaluation, there are kids who are coming off due to that early intervention. Um, both of these positions are forward-thinking positions. Uh, as any system shift or change, 
both of these positions are going to enhance what we do. And long term, we will need it's not something that we're responding to this particular, you know, years needs. It's long term thing. Mm -hmm. so, does that answer your question? So, um, I just want to say so, with the prevention model in mind, it just seems counterintuitive that we don't fund more at the earlier levels. Why don't we get reimbursed more? I mean, okay. as you were talking okay. about. Uh, it's so important to catch all of this early. Mm -hmm. We have it backwards. Uh -huh. The census model will change that. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is That's a perfect example. Yeah. So right. you're exactly right. Right now we're in the reimbursement model, and we don't get reimbursed for Triple E. In our census model, it'll be up to this board to give direction to your employees about what strategy you want to deploy that minimizes the need for specialized instructions while beefing up the prevention investment. Yep. Dan. Another monetary detail. Um, I did look in the legislative update. I see supervisor reunion slash school district referred to, uh, uh, and I wonder whether this money comes to the SU or to the districts within the SU on the yes. census page. It comes to the SU. Okay, good, good, good. So I think we all agree that that's a good thing. So I, I'm going to sound like a broken record because I've been preaching it for a long, long time, but, you know, Dover had the highest it, special education, one of the highest in the state. They actually sent two professors from UVM to Dover to come visit us for a whole week, and we got to meet with them and talk about why we were so bad, and that's when Susan Mack came up with the model with the preschool and the full day kindergarten and the extra additional training for staff, and, you know, Susan Mack walked into a Dover school board meeting and said, hmm, Dover, well, Hey, winter sports, I don't like having the teachers at the mountain skiing when our test scores are so low. So I propose we do away with winter sports. And I will say I was the only one who voted against it, not because I didn't agree with it, but because I said we shouldn't be voting on this. We should have this discussion. The next meeting, we had 120 parents at the meeting, and they were ready to tarn feather Susan back <laughs> on the board. And I, I stood up and I said, no, you know, we voted this as a board. And it worked out really well. The parents then took over the winter sports program, and Susan got at that time an extra, I think it was 10 or 12, it, uh, six total extra professional development days. And we brought in, she brought in um, people from King State to, to do the differential learning and the Dibbles thing, and I don't know what that stands for, so don't, don't ask me over there because it stands for something important in education. <laughs> and, you know, we actually saw about five or six years ago our special education spending went to zero. We had no special ed in our budget. Um, sometimes to become a victim of your success, our, our numbers started rising, so we have bringing, we, there's a lot of students that have come in that haven't been exposed to our program from the three and four year old. And I'm not saying, I, I, there's no, you can't study and track students. So, but um, you know, our special ed has gone up a little, has gone up some, but I think our current administrator is still happy with our model. I think our special educator for the district is like their model, Abby liked their model, I think Stephanie's been good. So I do really agree with you that I think every dollar we spend at the early level, that was Susan Mack's big thing, is, is gonna save us tenfold as they grow older. And we also had another educator on the board a while ago, um, Robin Wallace. I don't know if anybody remembers her. She was on the Dover board when I first got on. And she said, you know, we do our students no benefit when we, we hold them back. Um, because you remember the big thing was throwing aid at, you have a child that's having difficulties, give them an aid. And we would have students starting off in fourth, fifth, or sixth grade with an aid and then carry that through high school. And, you know, some of our students, it was an embarrassment, you know, walking down the hallway of the high school with your aide. So, I mean, I think that's helped. So I really, hopefully, that we can move this forward. And, and I think you guys are doing a great job. And, and um, you know, the whole central office and Bill's built a pretty good team. So, um, you know, hopefully we can see some progress. And, and maybe by the time we go to the census model, we'll be able to put more of our resources toward that because we won't need it on the high end. That's it. I'm off my soapbox. Mm -hmm. Are we okay with this director special education financial update? So, are you going to do um, about like a 15 minute presentation? Me today? Yeah. No, no, no. That's mm -hmm. for uh, okay. that's special. Education. You're talking about five. <laughs> yes, that's Mar Marlboro's request. Oh, Marlboro's right? request. 
So, Marlboro, do we want to sit on this request until we see what happens, or do you want to still move forward with the committee? My suggestion was going to be that we possibly send executive session meeting. I was thinking, yeah, like uh, June after the legislature ends, we could maybe see and just talk about what passed and what came out of it. Have one meeting at least right. to just say we're not banding together <laughs> or whatever, you know, where we are. Right. So yeah. yeah. So we usually reserve the third or fourth. Well, then, um, did you have anything else in your financial, or did we cut you off? No, no, you okay. guys are great. So Thank you. <laughs> we usually reserve the third and fourth Wednesdays of the month. That's there's usually no school district meetings. Those. So, can we do? What's the third? That's the twentieth. That's West River. It's the oh, you know, the what about the fourth? Bill twenty seventh. Will school be out by then? Yeah. Will legislature be out by then? <laughs> so can we can we get an executive committee meeting? You know, there'd be the board chair and the designee, and we need at least um, we need seven of the boards. A Wednesday, it would be the fourth Wednesday of June. And Bill said he would feed us. How about, How about the 13th? How about the third Wednesday? Well, yeah. you, the third is tied up. That's West River. We could do this. We could do the 13th. We usually don't do. Don't you? Do you have a school district that meets that night? <laughs> I will be in town on the 13th. Thank you. I, no, on the 27th. Okay. Is there a school district that meets on the 13th? No, that is open. How about the 13th, folks? It's three weeks away, roughly. It's, I won't be able to. I can do it. Okay. Why is no one here? There's all kinds of possibilities. We had so let's let's happen if we tentatively set a meeting. We send it around. Um, can you know? Can you make it? Thirty. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ken, can you make it? Uh, sure. Oh no. Joe? I can't. I yes. Won't be here. Dave, which Doug? Are we about? The I can make So we've we've got five or six without even trying. So why don't we shoot for that? And if it looks like people can't make it, so what we really got to please do is is respond when Bill sends this out. Just respond or Bill send out that thing where you can put yes I'm making it. <laughs> yes. Doodle poll. Doodle poll. Thank you. Whatever that thing is called. <laughs> is everybody okay with that? Okay, so the other thing is we cannot go into executive session because we don't have a quorum. And we didn't warn this as an executive. We only warned it as a board meeting, full board meeting. So what are we short? We we're up. short. Yeah, we, were, we need three more. Um, I'm sorry. 11, 12. We're three short. No, we need 15. We have 12. So I picked them up. I counted them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Oh, I'm sorry, thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. 13. Where's the camera? There's, 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 there's three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So we have thirteen, so I'm too short. And I can't count the extra two Marlboro. Oh, right, right. I'm getting shorter all the time, sir. So <laughs> it's that alchemy stuff. <laughs> um, so, I, Bill, we have to put off signing these contracts to then. Because I can't do that, and then Doug, if you want to bring that up, we'll yeah. talk after the meeting. It doesn't have to be executive session. We can talk in general terms. Okay. Now, do you want to talk now about anything, or, or no? I, no. I mean, okay. Not now. We can wait till later. No. no. And then you make tonight. Oh, tonight. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, in general, how do we talk about this? So we have at, at Marlboro School. Um, a lot of change going on. Um, we have three new hires coming in. Um, we have a new principal this year. Um, we have a lot of new, you know, state things that are happening. But so what we do is we sat down with our staff and our principal as a board and talked about, you know, uh, in general, there was a request for more days. They wanted more days, more professional development days internally in the school. Um, and so what we did was we laid out everything that they currently had as well as their request um, and 
what we were hearing from them was um, that they wanted to sort of claw back some of the SU days because, and this could be a discreet thing, but what, what the ask is tonight is for board members uh, of all the individual boards to go back to their, their administrators and their staff and talk to them to see, you know, how much of the professional development at the SU level is taking away from professional development and the in-school level, like, because right now, and again, I think it could be a discreet thing, but we right now have, uh, we need to align curriculum, we need to have teacher collaboration within, within the school, and not so much within uh, an SU. So they were hoping to claw back. I mean, they're very interested in the trauma session coming up, but we're, you know, the feedback we were getting was that maybe this could be a pick and choose thing uh, based on the needs, because, you know, some people, you know, that have attended things have um, felt that they could give that to the teachers at our school because they've either had that training or you know been a part of it. So for us, as a board, we're looking at giving them a certain number of days, but we want to squeeze out the most efficiency out of those days. And we're willing to give them it all, but they want it, if they, if they could have their way, they'd have almost all of it within the school itself because they really need to get aligned. So my request of the boards is to please go back to your board, your principals and your staff, what are you hearing? You know, we, we really weren't hearing a clamoring for we want a data-driven, multi-tiered <laughs> assessment. You know, that's not what we were hearing from our staff and from our principal. Um, it's interesting because in Jamaica, we're hearing the opposite. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> would you like to ask me Well, hang on one second. So who would make the determination and who would do the pick and choose? Would it be... Would that be directed by your administrator or would that be directed by the individual staff? They well, uh, I think that, and I'm going to speak for the board and they can shut me up if I'm wrong, but I think that we just said, what do you need from us? Can you put in the request for the days? You know, and I think I mean, we're not educators, so if you think that you need, you know, X amount of time together, what we were hearing was that they needed more time together and not so much apart. And that for us to add an extra five days at that cost, you know, and I don't want to say it was a cost, but it was more just like it just doesn't seem efficient. It seems like what they really wanted was more time together and to claw back some of those days at the SU. Okay, so Jamaica, I'm sorry, I cut you guys off, so go ahead and get the floor. Well, our administrator is sitting in the room, but I feel like we hear the opposite, that it's been very helpful to come together as an SU for these yeah. learnings. Am I stating that correctly? Well, most definitely. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say, we've heard a lot of yeah. positive feedback this year about the collaboration in the SU and how helpful it's been. So that's, mm -hmm. that's why it's strange to hear. Mm -hmm. Well, some of the, I mean, I think a lot of our or our staff has had some of the training that exists mm -hmm. or that was, that was held. But I think, you know, and my problem was that it was, it's discreet, right? It's going to change from year to year. It's going to be different things this year. It's going to be trauma and math. Next year could be something different. So for us to say, you know, oh, there's two days of trauma and three days of this, you know, we'll just give you two SU days. It just doesn't seem right. It seems like they need to have a choice of like whatever comes up, you know, that's gonna fit, our, you know, what's needed at the school. Because clearly we definitely want, you know, all of our kids, you know, performing up here. But in order to get the teachers there, I think all of our schools are in different places. And I don't think we can say that we're all in the same place and we're all gonna need math right now. Like we might have had two teachers come in that we just hired that have had that instruct, you know what I mean? I can, can disseminate that in our curriculum. So I just think that we need to be a little bit more flexible in a way. We as an SU. As we as an SU need to be more flexible. But then it also comes down to like, okay, well, how does that even work efficiently with funds when, you know, if Marburg doesn't participate in three days but two days, you know, how does that work? I understand that, you know, it could be an all or nothing thing, but I think that we need to have that discussion. And I was hoping to hear from all the boards, you know, because there's 11 districts, right, in, in our SU. Well, there's some non-operating. Yeah, non-operating, yeah. but like, yeah. So all the boards, from their staff, from their admin, what does that look like to you and how does that feel? Just okay. because, you know, we, we want to be efficient with our days. Might be an um, Joe, had his hand up, and then Lauren, if you want, we'll get, we'll get you. Oh, okay. So I, I have feedback from, from the Leland and Gray administrator already. Apparently he heard about this. And he said that uh, he wanted to know that the, he wanted us to let let you know that the time that he has set aside for professional development days 
are truly essential for the continuation of our improvement efforts. And he says, simply put, without that time, we would not be able to train our teachers to improve outcomes for students. Additionally, the alignments of the efforts SU-wide through Jen's office is essential for systematic change. Individual operations can vary greatly on quality and fidelity of professional development impl implementation. Systematic SU-wide approaches are far superior, in his opinion. Um, there's there's more in there as a board member, but um, you know that that's about as strong as I've ever seen our administrator come out. Yeah. <laughs> um, so right, and that's SU level. That's not in house. That is that's SU level. And gray, which, which is so most of the schools in our SU are ending up at Leland and Gray, but that's not necessarily the case in Marlboro. So that's maybe why math instruction for all of the schools that end up at Leland and Gray should probably be very aligned where in Marlboro what we're hearing from our teachers and our administrator is maybe the way they're doing it there is more efficient for our district. Um, but, the, but the trauma they were completely on board with and see that that's really important that everybody participate. Um, and we're also just kind of saying that we just want some flexibility that it could change from year to year. And so this is a particular year where our, our staff really needs way more time in-house. Um, and we're already, as a board, agreeing, I believe, I don't know if we've voted on this yet, but at least in concept, that we're going to be raising more money to give them more days anyway. Um, but yeah. how we use those days, we'd like flexibility with. So just so I'm done, I'm not misquoting or anything. So you're not looking for a huge discussion night or an answer. You'd like to just ask the boards to maybe, you know, go yeah. back and talk with their staff, if they, with their administrator. Yeah. I mean, clearly, Joe. I mean, knows. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I'd like to hear from you know the other. You know, Wyndham. I don't think is Wyndham would probably want to go back and talk to their, their yeah. staff. Um, I, I can just say that in our school, it has had some impact, some negative impact on the student population to have the teachers miss as much as they do. Yeah. So, <coughs> is there anybody else that, everybody from Marlboro okay that want to speak? Anybody else? Go ahead. Yeah, I can speak to that. So, we actually posed the question to not only the administrators, but the, the teachers as well. Uh, we wanted to get their take on how they felt about professional development. Uh, and they brought back to our last board meeting just a you know, quick paragraph about how they felt. Uh, everybody was across the board enthusiastic about uh, professional development and excited to to you know have some synergy and collaboration with not only the, the folks within their building but others in the WCS here. But to the point for Marble, I mean I do understand the our, all of our schools are aligned. Right. Right. You know, right. more, we're Definitely. trying to synergize, we're trying to do right. exactly that. Um, and it is understandable that you may have a different, you know, a different route you want to take. So, and you are currently in such a unique spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, anyway, I mean, sort of layer upon layer. So let's let's all stare at Dave because Dave has a school that they can go anywhere. <laughs> you're not, we're not a, you're not aligned, even well, though I'm most. I'm lucky of enough to have my administrator here. Also, and I wonder if Tammy might have any insight. So I would say that the professional development that was offered uh, to the district was incredibly helpful, and that the teachers um, were incredibly engaged, and it was extremely beneficial. So I don't think it's taking away from any time you could be spending together? Uh, the days uh, that were offered through the district were non-school days, so it didn't have any impact on the students that way. It was just a non-school day. Oh, did you want to speak? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, think it's invaluable, really. And there's some, um, really some crucial components to it. So one is the SUY, um, where we're all participating and gathering a shared understanding of um, this new learning and specific to math that was aligned with mathematical practice standards, so not a specific program or, um, but uh, approaches that could be used in any and for any um, grade level. Um, so that SU, that SU sort of global picture, but then um, the work that grade level meetings did as a follow up for that brought it, narrowed it down just a little bit more. And then um, administrators were also responsible for bringing it to the school, right? So it 
it was um, a big umbrella, if you will. And so those are really the key components. So having that school-based discussion and then individual conversations with teachers really make it full circle. Um, I think that the last couple of years have been phenomenal, so thank you. Okay. And you don't have to just say Mm -hmm. As far as, you know, I've, I've heard nothing but uh, praise for all the SU ones from the staff and the bar administrator. And I know they do some stuff in-house and at New Bros. They make. If they need it, they, if they need it, they get it, you know, whatever they need and just work with it. So. And again, I don't mean it to sound as if it's not needed or anything like that. I just I just feel like what is needed is the in-house right now, and that's what we're dealing with. And you're in a unique position this yeah. year just because we, of a new administrator and some new staff. We have a lot of new things and a lot of change agents within our program uh, from a project-based standpoint. So I just feel like, or project-based curriculum, I should say. So, you know, we're looking at things and how do we squeeze the most efficiency out of them? And I think that can you evolve? People could respect that. <laughs> so, um, Bill, not to put you on the spot. Sure. Um, or, or, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, Bill was at our conference. Yeah, meeting, yeah. So no, no, I've been totally a part of this whole conversation. Okay. No, I mean, I think that uh, what you're bringing up is uh, it's, it's Vermont, right? It's freedom and unity. And um, I think there's incredible value in respecting both of those things. I, I, I don't think we should be choosing. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's absolutely both. There's a reason that we do an SU level continuous improvement plan to kind of build the foundational knowledge that can then be uniquely applied to each individual situation. It's why each individual school does a continuous improvement plan that fits those particular needs. So I think it's a false choice. I think we need to do both. And I think that um, I can look at uh, Dover does uh, all the WCSU learnings together, and then they do something extremely particular to their building of IB. And um, Townsend and Leland and Gray have agreed to take half days next year at the same time. And Jamaica uses their winter sports days to be very particular to their building. And Wardsboro uses their winter sports days to be very particular to their building. So, um, I hate that you have uh, a competitive environment for the uh, growth of the whole and then the growth of the specific. So uh, my dream would be is that every building uh, could get what they needed as well as the whole continues to rise. So I understand, but you used specific examples, Bill, where things were already in place. And I'm talking about time to develop the things that aren't in place. We don't have an IB. You mentioned Dover has an IB, they're working specifically on that. Yeah, they're going to something. We're, we're, we have to develop that thing. So how do we do that with five days? You know, it just doesn't seem you well, know. Well, I would just say possible. kind of what Laura was saying is that the, the five days for the WCSU are designed to be universally. They're not specific. We're not learning a program. We're learning high quality instructional practice that can be used everywhere. It's not going to a particular, because we have to design it for three schools that go to, that have choice. We have five schools that feed into one high school. So it benefits us all when we develop the capacity that is universal. And so research and evidence have shown us these are the high quality instructional practices. These are the math practice standards that we're currently working on. But they might look very different in Wardsboro or Marlboro or Dover, um, but they're universal. I mean, we are extremely intentional about making that happen. I mean, we're extremely fortunate to have a director of curriculum that we have. We hadn't had that for the previous seven years. So we hadn't been doing those kinds of things. And now that we have built on it the last two years, it, there's <coughs> wonderful momentum. Um, and then just kind of going the next thing, it would, um, when, when we go to the census model, we're all in. That's, that's all of us. You know, we're going to get this big block of money. And so we've got to develop some level of teamwork and trust that um, develops the whole. 
but I absolutely agree with you that different schools are going to be in different places at different times. So we have to make sure that it's adaptable to both of those things. I would just hate to have them compete with each other instead of to accelerate and add to each other. I think it was Lauren that was talking about at the meeting how important it was for the Marlboro teachers to work with other teachers in our district to hear about what the instructional practices are that are particular in project-based learning. Couldn't agree more. That's outstanding. But if you're not there, that's not going to happen. So I just want to clarify something, too, because I don't know if we're all on the same page. So when Jen was up presenting her thing, so years and years ago, we would have a presentation. And here's our new math program. It's Joe Blow's math program. And, and here's all the, the manipulatives you use. And this is the textbook. And it, and that's not what we're doing here. We're, we're not doing a specific program. So you're giving you're kind of working on maybe things that have changed in the teaching world that maybe if I went to the teacher school 10 years ago, I didn't pick up. I, I wasn't given that because that wasn't a, a new way that we instructed. So you're moving more on how to instruct, not a specific thing, but just how to instruct in general. And then they have to take it back and we have to take and everybody takes it to their school to put it to their particular program that they're, they're Use their structure, how, they how are, do they have multi-grade, do they have individual grade, do they go up to K through 8, do they only go K through 6, do their kids all go to one school, do their kids go to multiple schools, um, have they been teaching for one year, they've been teaching for 10. Um, yeah, it's got to be unique to each individual building, so we're very intentional about making sure that, the, that what we're planning on doing um, is universal. Yeah. Okay. So I think, Doug, your ask is a very simple ask. You're just asking with each board just talk with their administrator and, and their staff, however they, they want to do do that, and just get it in, like, obviously yeah. in Wyndham, you're not really sure. Jamaica, you, you know, um, we lucky we had a couple administrators here in a letter from one. And then at this meeting on the 13th, we can just have this discussion again. Sure. And then, Bill, you you know what he's looking for. Is there maybe, anything that you want from my office before the budget? Is there anything that would help you guys? Um, I don't think so. If we do, I mean, we're, we'll bring this back and we'll talk, um, you know, with our administrator and staff and see um, if there's any needs. But, you know, honestly, for us, it was more just a request coming from the ground up of just like, hey, right. we need this time, you know, and the principal's like, we need more time, I need more time with my teachers, you know, we need to get, you know, third and fourth, and or yeah, third and fourth in sync with fifth and sixth, then we need to get, we just started a pre-K school, you know, so we get, <coughs> get pre-K kindergarten in sync with one and two, and that's a new hire right there, <laughs> like two new hires for pre-K and kindergarten. So there's a lot that needs to be built up, and we aren't a school that feeds into one high school, like, you know, five of our districts are. So we have, you know, 50% in Brattleboro and the rest go all over the place. So we're not looking for just one math curriculum, you know, that we're feeding up to. Can, or can I add this. one thing, too, that I was hearing from our staff is we've already added several extra days to their school year um, recently, and now we're doing it again. And we have a very seasoned staff. We have a couple of new ones coming in, but the seasoned staff are like, I've been doing this a really long time, and now you want me to come an extra five days? You know, so we're responding to um, both our, our new principal and our staff, and we're trying to have this be something that we're working together, and where it's not a top-down, you must do, but we're trying to, like, be organic to our community and hear what they're saying and why they're saying it. So it was really useful for me, at least tonight, to hear the feedback from all of you and to realize that most of you really are getting a lot out of what the WCSU is offering. And you know, we we'll bring that back to our school. Um, but I would also really appreciate hearing from Bill that there's room. For the outlier, if we're the outlier, we, you know, th there's room for us to try to figure out what's going to work for us this year. Mm -hmm. I appreciate hearing that. And one of the things that I, I didn't talk about, but when Dover said we need to do something, um, Tina Shakespeare was in, remember we had two curriculum coordinators, we had the math, science, and, and language arts, and I know Tina spent an inordinate amount of time in our school versus some other schools at that time because Susan was willing to have her in there and work and maybe that's something that you know your administrator needs to discuss with Bill and, and Jen 
maybe some more of her time when she's not doing the, the curriculum or the, the, the district wide and maybe Bill that's something you can work on too is how your resources because you know maybe the other schools are pretty well set with stuff now but they, they're trying to incorporate a preschool program Absolutely. and so then maybe you get some extra help this year to get your preschool program running and then maybe next year it's Wardsboro starts a preschool program so they get that little bit extra help <laughs> and I think too that needs to be looked at it or Jamaica I guess I don't know whoever yeah. needs Wardsboro have a preschool no but Jamaica has pre-k oh you have pre-k in Wardsboro yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm just throwing stuff out. So <laughs> I'm sorry, but yeah, you know, I think that's a good point too. And maybe Bill, that's something to bring back. And so why don't we just put that on the agenda for the 13th meeting? Idea. So I've got two other real quick things because I just want to make some people aware. At the River Valley District meeting, we've been talking about the gentleman back there that records us, and every now and then, if you get him to talk, it's really good because it like breaks that imaginary wall and stuff. And you can't get them to laugh occasionally. <laughs> so we, you, there's a fee that you pay to have them come. We were discussing at River Valley was the fee worth it and, and how we reach out. We actually did a survey, and we actually had a lot of the surveys say, hey, you know, we didn't know what was, we don't know what's going on. And we're like, gosh, we, we have it recorded. There's minutes. We hired um, Anita to do some stuff for us. So he just brought us to the, our meeting on Monday night um, that if you guys... I thought it was kind of interesting. He's got the number of hits on YouTube for the for the River Valley <laughs> and so like we've had anywhere so like the 423 and the 26 you know under 100 but we've had between you know 200 and, and 300 on the the April 2nd meeting we had 681 hits so people are getting to watch it, and I, I think it's valuable. But the best one is on 11-6, we had 3,900 hits. Oh, wow. yeah. dog. That's because we did our dog and pony show, and Laura did a dance and then her <laughs> But she's not even listening. She just left. So, yeah. Yeah. She just left. Like, I have nothing to do this. So anyway, um, Rick said it was, Rick said it was um, the River Valley was similar to a school district in California, the initials. So he thinks that maybe something big happened in November out there. There was a everybody fist fight. Was looking for it. There's, so, a, there's a marching yeah. band. Oh, marching band. In Ooh. California. And they put on a big show on that particular weekend. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just I thought it was, it was interesting. <laughs> it was more. It was all you, wasn't it? We what did I do? The 3,900 hits we had back in November <laughs> so anyways they're, they're, these are out and I don't know if any of you have but I have had several people say hey I saw you on TV the other oh, night or what were you yeah, discussing so it is good to and then especially like so your staff can go see what the discussion was oh, you, yeah, yeah, you, right. when you were talking to me about the fact that I'm not a voting member and yet here I am I'm seeing it live <laughs> you're talking about 3,900 people who are watching it on television that is sad <laughs> and especially if there's no marching band. Yeah, you got to fill up the time somehow. Folks, I got one last thing that's really important, I think, to Wyndham and to Marlboro and to our district. Um, remember, we went in January, the officers went up and met with, um, we met with the Secretary of Education at that time, who was still here, and and Donna Russo Savage, I think Brad James was in that meeting, mm -hmm. and we were asking them about the study and how come we hadn't been hearing anything. And if you remember that um, Mr. French guy, not the one that was on TV, came in, and so we had kind of left that meeting under the impression that they were going to kind of give us a little preview about the SU stuff going on, and so we hadn't heard anything. So we wrote a letter back at the um, end of April. So we actually got a May 8, 2018 response. So it was from Donna Russo Savage, and she's a principal assistant to the Secretary of Ed. Do we have any Secretary of Ed? <laughs> we have a. So, dear Rich, thank you for your letter regarding a meeting with the agency concerning any redrawn SU boundaries that may be included in the proposed statewide plan. You all know that comes out June 1st. We don't remember promising you a preview of the changes that might be proposed for the Women of Central SU. But that representation very well may have been made at the January meeting, as you say. Now, there was three of us, and we all think it was said, but... Was it videotape? No. No, we couldn't get him in there. In any event, 
I'm sure that you can appreciate that we'll be working till the very last minute on this enormous project. Decisions on precisely what the agency will propose to the state board probably won't be firm until the final days, and we will not be giving any district or SU a preview of the particulars before June 1st. I can tell you, however, that at this time, we do not anticipate that we will suggest that SU boundaries changes occur on July 1st, 2019 for any SU anywhere in the state. So that's kind of a good thing. Um, one of the things that happened, I went up with, well, yeah. and one of the things which is better than I thought could have happened. So one of the things that happened is I went up with Wyndham and I went up with Stratton for their meeting with the, the education department. So they didn't go before the Board of Ed like you. They're, they just have to go to this group for when they decide on a change. And we, I remember asking, I don't think, I think it was in the Stratton one, not the Wyndham one, is who's making this decision? Because we had Donna Russo Savage. There was another attorney there from the state. That's, um, yeah, um, I forgot her name already. Is it Emily? No. Simmons? No. Emily Simmons? No. no. Oh, she's pretty oh, okay. okay. So there was two two attorneys there, I guess, Donna Russo, another lady who's like legal counsel, and then Brad James. And I asked the question, I said, well, the law says that it's the Secretary of Education, and we don't even get to meet with her. Are we going to, you know, is Wyndham and Stratton going to get another chance? And, you know, I kind of got slammed down pretty hard by her saying, well, you know, the Secretary can't do everything. I said, yeah, but the law's pretty specific. And isn't it funny how you take certain parts of the law when you want them and not other times? <laughs> But so I guess for right now it, it was those three that were going to make the dis we're going to kind of put the plan together and present it to the acting whoever and at that time I don't think there was an acting secretary or anybody who knew who it was going to be but the one thing I found interesting is is that once they do that plan then they present it to the state board of ed and then they're going to hold three meetings one in Jul July August September and they're going to do one in the northern part of the state one in the central part of the state, one in the southern part of the state, which probably means <coughs> Rutland somewhere. But um, <laughs> so that's when like Stratton and Wyndham would have a chance to go, um, kind of get a hearing before the board. But we should see the proposal around June first. They did say that they weren't giving any previews because they didn't want to like start getting people either worked up because there's so many balls in the air. So I just I thought it was kind of promising though because even though it's only a year, you know when we were looking at that report we we were thinking they were going to recommend supervisory yeah. union boundary changes right away. So I think we feel a lot better about that. Is that okay? Well, I felt I felt a real <laughs> sigh of relief. I think maybe the central office did too. I was just going to say the attorney's name is Molly Bond. Molly, yeah, that's it, Molly. So, anyways, since we're not an official meeting, we can't call an adjournment. June 13th, the executive. Just executive. Just, let's warn it as just an executive. Warn it as both, and then that way enough members come and we need to vote something else. But we'll shoot for just executive. Well, I thought we did. I, 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 I literally it. cut and pasted. I, I missed it. Okay, so I really appreciate it. and. You know, again, last meeting, you know, Wyndham, you guys brought something to the table, and you know, we had a really good discussion. Marlboro, I think your yours brought up a really good discussion, some good points, and that's kind of why we meet. So thank you guys. Yeah. It was a really, I think it's been a really good meeting. We're out a little bit over, but we'll blame it on the uh, curriculum development person. <laughs> <laughs> I know she went in.